thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Um, hopefully you can see I've had the lights turned off because I think some of the slides are quite dark. Um, I've got some code examples as well coming up, so if you can't see them clearly, shout up and I'll try and talk you through them. Um, so, yeah, I didn't really sort of plan to talk today. I, I just signed up on the waiting list uh, a couple of months ago and then kind of Ash said, ah, oh, hi, I noticed you're on the waiting list. Uh, I can get you a ticket, but there's a catch. So that's why I'm speaking today. Um, so a bit about me. Uh, people who know me might tell you that I'm grumpy. That's why, uh, but I'm really lovely once you get to know me, I promise. Um, as Gwen said, uh, I probably identify as a developer. I've been developing software since 2000. Uh, I did a degree in computer science. Programming was something I was really keen on as a child, something I always wanted to do. Uh, I got a job um, working for a small IT consultancy down south. Um, I would probably say up to about 2007 would be what I consider the dark ages. Um, so we didn't have source control. Source control licenses were expensive, so you know emails were what you used to send patches around. So there'd be one person on the team nominated for kind of you know emailing patches to and doing the build. Um, no continuous integration. We didn't write unit tests. Um, testers were. Um, well, testing was something that the test team did. Ideally, they'd be in a different building. Um, <laughs> and then, um, you know, then I moved uh, back to Yorkshire, uh, sort of 2003. Uh, things got a little bit better. We had the source control, so we had Visual Source Safe. Uh, we had a nightly build. Um, testing was still something done by the test team, and ideally, they were in a different part of the building this time. Um, and then 2007, I joined a startup called Aerodyne. So I think some of the, well, some familiar faces from Aerodyne here. Um, so they were a really cool startup, and they were driven by the ex extreme programming methodology. So we did we had CI, we had uh, pairing, we did TDD, uh, and that's really where I kind of started my journey along, you know, learning how to test. So up to this point, I kind of had no real idea how how we tested software, other than just throw it over the wall. Um, so that was 10 years ago. Uh, learned a lot about TDD and testing and things like that, and still learning. Um, as Gwen said, I now run a dev team for QuantBet. Uh, so that's a small dev team of about six, six of us. So that's a bit about me. So with this talk, this talk's about common anti-patterns that I see um, time and time again when developing software, specifically written by developers generally. So there was a James Carr blog post, I think it was done in 2004, 2006, something like that, uh, on kind of common TDD anti-patterns. I originally did a quick lightning talk at Agile Yorkshire based on it. Um, so this is a kind of expanded, deeper dive into some of those patterns. Uh, there's a copy of the blog, blog post there. Uh, and then a shout out to this book, which uh, I read this probably about 2010, uh, Growing Object Orientated Software Guided by Tests, or Goose, as that's a bit of a mouthful. That's a really, really good book, and that changed how I view testing, and some of the solutions to some of the anti-patterns are in that book, so I highly recommend it. Uh, in fact, any new starter on our team has recommended that book and makes read it if they, don't, if they haven't. So, um, we talk about patterns in software all the time. So, patterns are re. Um, if you're talking to another developer or a tester on your team, you can say, ah, oh, well, we could solve this using a strategy pattern or a factory pattern. Uh, if you're writing automated end to end tests, you'll be familiar with that if you write using the page object pattern, things like that. Um, and then patterns can go bad. So you, that's, that's what an anti-pattern is, basically. So a pattern, somebody picks up on it, they think it's a good idea, and they template it out. And it might seem a good idea initially, but then you quickly realize that actually it's a nightmare. It's introduced problems in the code base. It makes your code harder to change. So that's what I mean by an anti-pattern. Uh, so just setting a bit of context. Um, so I'm sure we're all familiar with the uh, testing pyramid. 
So we strive to have lots of small, quick running unit tests at the bottom, mainly written by developers, um, and then less as we go further up that take longer to run and exercise more and more of the system as it's put together. So this talk's focused mainly at the bottom and a little bit further up. Um, so I'm a Java developer. Um, I kind of, so this is my disclaimer. I am a Java developer. I learned Java at university. The projects I started on were Java. I've done Java for 17 years professionally. I've had, you know, trips into Python for a bit. But, you know, in the, the company I've joined, we do Java. Java has a lot of faults. I'm not blind to them. It's very verbose. You write a lot of boilerplate. Um, you know, other languages you can solve problems more succinctly in. Having said that, I think Java has a lot going for it still. It has a great community, a lot of open source frameworks. It's paid my bills for 17 years. It's probably going to pay them for another 10 at least, I would say, maybe get me through to retirement. Uh, but I'm not blind to the fact that Java actually causes some of these problems that I'm going to talk about. Right, so the first one. So actually, I originally had this kind of right at the end of the slide deck because it was like it's quite a small one uh, and it seemed like a bit of a throwaway thing. But actually, it's quite pervasive and we see it over and over again. So how many people have seen a test? Right, that's quite difficult to read, isn't it? <laughs> so this test, it says uh, the test is called bug342. So how many people have seen have looked in the code base and seen a test that's got a name like that. Yeah. So that I don't know about you, but that makes me mad because I then have to load up Jira or um, some god awful dev tracking tool and check what the actual problem it was trying to solve was, um, which is a pain in the ass. And also maybe maybe that bug fix was actually done years ago and you know your company's now being bought by another company and they've replaced the dev tracker with Jira and we don't have that history anymore. So I now have no idea why that, you know, I can, this is actually quite a simple test. Um, so it says on push, a tag push event and then it says verify the git event listener is never called with the push method. So that's quite a small test so I can probably sort of you know, sit there and go, all oh, right, okay, I, I think I can see what's going on. But quite often, if people are writing test methods called like bug342, the test is probably not going to be that short and nice. It's probably going to be a massive 300 line monster and you're going to have no idea what it's going on about. So really simple thing, just call it tag events are ignored and do not notify listener. So that's now clear what the intent behind that test is. And then that really helps going forward because if that behavior is no longer desirable, we can either remove that test or we can modify it and change the name so it's the desirable behavior. So I um, don't know if anyone's watching the new Star Trek. Still not sure about it. Um, but as Captain Lorca said, you know, universal law is for lackeys, context is for kings. So just give it a proper name. And that's you know, generally true in IT. Naming things is really, really hard. If you name something well, then you know, that gives the next person reading your code a head start. Right, the object mother pattern. Has anybody heard of the object mother pattern? So one person. So I hate this pattern. I absolutely hate it from bitter personal experience. So. It was, uh, the term was originally coined by ThoughtWorks um, on one of their projects, and they put it on a, they obviously, uh, they thought the name was catchy, um, and put it on a blog post, and it kind of became quite prominent. So the idea is it's used to birth objects. Sounds fairly painful. Um, but basically, you just have a set of pre-canned examples. So if you're, you know, you might have man with hat, or, you know, you might have, uh, if you're doing loans, you might have, you know, student, unemployed person, you know, person earning over 40 grand. So you've got a whole set of examples that you've got available to use. So your tests become just specified in terms of examples. 
So, you know, if an employed person, then loan not approved. If earning more than 40 grand, then loan is approved. So you can see how it's going to be a really nice thing for using your test because you've just got all these examples that you can draw from. Um, so you might struggle to see what's going on here, but this is what it would look like in Java. So um, we deal with sports, so most of my examples have been in terms of sports. So we've got um, Everton versus Liverpool pre-match. So we've got Everton and Liverpool. We've got a list of periods, so it's pre-match, and then we have a list of incidents. So incidents are things that happen during the game, so home goal, away goal. So that's great. So I've got Everton versus pre-match. Now I want them to go into the first half. So our we like immutable objects. So when I say immutable objects, once it's constructed, we can't modify it. So immutable objects are really good because um, you don't have people changing state underneath you. So it's a lot easier to reason about. It's a lot easier to do concurrent code. The problem is, every time I want to tweak an example slightly, I end up copying and pasting. So I've got Everton versus Liverpool in the first half. So I just copy and paste that, that first example, and then I put the first half period in there. And then I want Everton versus Liverpool first half nil one, because Liverpool have scored. So again, I copy the previous example, and now I add an incident for the away goal in the first half. And what happens is you get this massive proliferation of examples, and they're just copied and pasted. So the problem is here. The problem is in the constructor of our, our object, it's these lists, because there's no way to modify it. So what happens is when you want to add something new, so say we want to, so in this period, we've got no concept of whether the clock is running. So say I want to add the fact that, now you might say you, you're able to infer that the clock's running uh, in, in football, because if it's pre-match, the clock's not running. It's the first half or the second half, the clock's running. So I could infer that in the domain somewhere else and say if it's this type of period, then the clock's running. If it's this type of period, the clock's not. However, that doesn't really work because uh, when you've got particularly bad stoppages, you actually stop the clock. And then if we want to scale this generic model out to something like rugby, the um, clock actually stops when the ball goes dead. So if it goes out for a line out or a try or whatever, the clock actually stops until the ball goes live. So we want to add um, whether the clock was running or not. So if I modify the incident constructor to take a Boolean or a, an enumeration saying whether the clock's running or not, I've now got um, one, two, three, four, five places where I have to change that code. And I've only got three examples. So if I've got hundreds to make a change to the object, I've got hundreds of breaking changes. Um, so we had this when we were doing horse racing. So, you know, horse races, we had examples where we had 16 runners, and then we might maybe want to add the flag to say whether it was a non-runner or not. And suddenly we've got 300, 400 breaking compilation changes. And it just makes the code really brittle and really, really hard to change. And you just get reticent to change it, and you just kind of start jamming stuff in in different places because it's easier. Um, so if the problem's in our constructor, um, oh yeah, did I mention Java? So part of the problem here is this, this is potentially you know, a problem that's exacerbated by Java. Um, other languages have features that make it far easier to deal with. For instance, Kotlin has a copy constructor. So here, if I've got Jack with a name, Jack, age equals one, Kotlin, I can just say copy Jack and twiddle the name, twiddle his age. So that's quite an elegant way of doing it. We don't really have that in Java. So, boo Java. So there must be a better way, and there is. It's called the test data builder. So this is one of the patterns that's in Goose. So it's a really subtle tweak. So this is a tweak to our uh, constructor. Um, it takes a bit, rather than taking the incidents, the periods, the competitors, it takes a builder. So we actually have a builder class that effectively, for every variable we want, or per, uh, member field we want to set, we mimic that in the builder. 
So again, this is where Java, we do end up writing lots of boilerplate code. Java has some frameworks that kind of will generate those for you, but you know, I think opinions split as to whether you want to use them or not. For me, they're a bit like magic, but other teams swear by them and use them, with things like Lombok. So anyway, it takes a builder. So the way to you have to go through the builder to construct your object. So you can say a sporting event, set da 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 dot build. <coughs> so the builders are mutable because you don't pass the builders around. You use the builder to construct your examples and then you build a sealed object and then pass that around. So you've got the benefit of immutability, but you can actually tweak the examples. So these are the examples reworked to use the builder. Um, so here we start, and, and our builders return builder, so it's not a sealed object, which means we can tweak it until we actually need to use it. So here, Everton versus Liverpool returns us a builder, and it takes Everton and Liverpool uh, as competitors. And then in pre-match, we just simply add on, so we take that existing example, and we add to it. And then, so to move it to the first half, we take that example and we keep doing that. And it, initially it looks like more code, but it's actually far more uh, maintainable because now if, I, so here I've got this thing that will actually construct me a first half away goal. So it'll say uh, period, first half type, away goal. If I now want to make that, uh, have take a variable, which is whether it's running or not, I've actually only got to change this place here, and in fact I can default it in the builder. So now when I want to add things, I've only actually got one place that I need to make a change. It won't break all my existing examples. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah, so the, these are screenshots, but I can actually show you it in the IDE. Okay. So, what's, do you want to see the example of the builder? Is that the, yeah. What have I called it? Uh, right. Yeah, I'm going to change, change the color. So, lucky I practiced this last night. Um, Right, is that better? Right. Oh God, why is it I don't know why it's highlighted the uh, member fields that way. It's really unhelpful. Uh, so this is, so I've actually written all the examples so that I could screenshot them. So this is what the builder looks like. So you can see that these are all mutable. These take uh, builders and then at the point that they, they get built and then added in. Um, so that's what the builder looks like. But you can see the problem I talk about with Java where there's a lot of repetition because the builder looks exactly like um, the actual class you're doing. So um, that's why a lot of people like things like Lombok because you can just have a at builder annotation and then you just have some final um, member fields and then just stuff gets magicked up for you. The problem is for that you need uh, like a plugin in your build system and you probably need a plugin installing in your IDE for it to know that those um, methods and uh, things will be generated for you. Um, I think if the language supported as first class citizen, it would be a lot better. Uh, so I'll just find a usage of that. So this is the example, so you can, it's, yeah, it's a lot clearer, isn't it? So you can see that we start off with Everton versus Liverpool, and then we kind of move to pre-match first half, and then we kind of go, you know, nil one, nil two. But you can see how it'd be very easy to then get an example where it's, it's a draw, where it's one one, because you just take the Everton versus Liverpool first half one nil, and just add a first half home goal, which would be super easy to do. So these, these make a massive difference to testing because once you can suddenly create examples really easily, then it's really easy to take an example you've already got and then just fiddle it. And so you can say, right, well, if the system behaves in this way, and then if I make this simple change, 
So if I move to half time, then I won't be pushing any prices out. So it, it makes it really easy to write really clear, concise tests where you just, if I just change this one thing, this is then how the behavior of the system changes. It makes your tests a lot clearer. That all makes sense. So I th whenever there's code, I'll probably just nip back to the ID and show you, because obviously it's not super great. But does that make sense? Okay, cool. Uh, this is another one that we see quite commonly, success against all odds. So you know the Daleks, fairly indestructible race that just sweep and conquer all that they come across. Um, right, so I'll show you the code that I'm some text on this one. So the, the idea with this one, I'll show you the code in a minute, is that um, we've been, somebody's got an email service that sends an email. Um, we get an email object in and we want to call this person's email service. But we want to do that in an asynchronous way, by which I mean when they, so they want us to write an endpoint so that they can just say, go and deliver this email. And we go, yeah, okay, we'll do that. But we do that off thread. So I, they can just be chucking emails at us and we'll be buffering them up and we'll be sending them on. So we're, we're just trying to write this simple buffering endpoint. Uh, and we just start with a really simple implementation that will do it on a single thread and there's no retry or anything like that. Um, so it's a simple endpoint for sending emails. The endpoint schedules the emails we sent on a different thread client code can carry on doing their processing without waiting for the email to be sent, safe in the knowledge it will get sent. Uh, so we want to test that the correct values are passed on to the pending service. So I'll show you the um, code that we're trying to test. Right. So the code's super simple. So uh, we just use the built-in concurrency libraries that Java's got. So we have a single thread executor. That means there's only one thread that could send this email. So they will get sent in the order they get, um, we get notified about them. So when somebody s says to us, can you send this? We say, sure, we'll, we'll submit a lambda to the executor service that will send an email to the recipient with the content and the subject. So that's, that seems pretty simple. So, so simple, I just go and write that code and then go, right, now I'll go and write a test um, to make sure that it um, does the right thing. So this is the test that I wrote. So, we just construct an email. So um, I like to use random test data rather than kind of hard-coded values um, so that it's different every time. Uh, quite often I've seen where if you kind of hard-code IDs, if you use like one and one or whatever, it's quite easy to get them transposed and you don't notice that they've, not, that they've been transposed because the, the values are so similar. So try, try and use kind of randomized test data. So, we construct an email, uh, we construct an endpoint with, with a stub, so this, is, this asserts, so this is mocking out the email service that this other person's given us. So the idea is that that will assert, so when that will assert that the recipient is the same, the subject is the same as the email and the content of the email. So that seems pretty sensible. And then we just go send and it should assert and, you know, the world should be a happy place. Um, so that's just the test that I've shown you. So when we run that, it turns out an email does get sent, so that's good. But oh no! Um, you can see that the subject and the past and the uh, content have actually been interchanged. So that's a bit weird, because 
I th you know, we tested that here. We made sure that the subject was the same as the subject and the content was the same as the content. The problem was I never ran that test. Uh, well, no, I never wrote, I wrote the code and then I wrote the test and the test passed. So it must have been right. Um, so we can just work through that now. So I'll prove it. So I'll run the test. It definitely passes. So that's really weird. So the first thing I could do is if I um, actually just say, right, OK, when we send the email, let's just break this completely. So we'll just comment this code out that would send the email. And I'll run the test again. <laughs> it still passes, right? So, so how useless is that test? Right. Does anybody know why that test doesn't work? This is a bit, maybe this is a bit unfair. I don't know what people's technical. You're just testing the, the values that you set up from the start. It says the values at the end. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I, but I've now commented out the code that actually sends those values. So I'm not even. I've, sorry? That's exactly it. So, yes. So. The trick is to realize that the whole point of this thing was that we were actually uh, sending it asynchronously. So when we invoke send on that, it then gets put on a different thread of execution. So we actually have no idea whether that assertion ever gets run or not. And we certainly, if it does get run, it happens in a different thread, which is never caught by the uh, thing. So interestingly, if I put that code back in, And we'll run it here. It's still, you know. But if I actually run it on the command line, uh, let's scroll up. Ah, oh, there it is. So it's actually that assertion has failed, uh, and it is spat out in the logs. But um, IntelliJ never showed it. So um, what we need to do is we need to write a test that fails first. So one of the things that you can do is, so that's rubbish. Um, so are people familiar with mocks and mocking framework? <coughs> um, so one of the things that we like using is Makito. So Makito is quite nice. So rather than kind of writing our own stub or uh, mock endpoint, we can just use Makito. So here I will mock it out. Um, get rid of that. So basically, in the before method, we will construct the endpoint and pass it the mock. So that just sets the world up, so we call send on that. And then what I can do with Makito is I can say verify that the mock email service. And then you can say, you can give it a timeout. So I can say within 100 milliseconds, so I, within one second, make sure that this method is invoked. Um, so email.getrecipient, email.getsubject. Email dot get content. Um, so we'll just short one there like that. Okay, and then run that. Right, so that's failed. Um, and it's not failed in the way I expected, I don't think. Right, yeah. So there's an important lesson. So I ran it, it failed, it'd be easy for me to batter on and assume that uh, it failed in the way I expected. If it didn't, it's because I hadn't, wasn't running it with the right runner. Right, there you go. So now it fails in the way that I expect. Um, so you can see, 
So perhaps my test date is not great. I might, maybe I could make this more obvious, like I could prefix, you know, I could make the uh, recipient look more like a, an email address. I could maybe prefix my subject with subjects and content. So that's one of the things that's useful when you run it is kind of see the feedback you get when it fails and make sure that if it were to fail for somebody else, it would be obvious why it's failed. But I can see because I made the content longer, I can see that I've actually got those two in the wrong order. Um, so I can just go and actually fix. And there's the bug. So I've just got those in the wrong order, basically. Um, so now if I go back a minute. There you go. It passes. So the test must fail first. So that's one of the things that if you follow TDD, you know, that's kind of ingrained in that write a failing test, see it fail, make it pass. That's really important because you just, otherwise you don't know that you're testing, you know, it might look right, <laughs> that, that test looked right at first glance, but it was actually testing nothing. So, you know, if I come along and I'm modifying somebody else's code, I'm like, well, it's all fine. You know, I'm protected by tests. Well. Not always. Uh, and the second thing is that when it does fail, make sure it fails in the way that you expect. Don't kind of just batter on going, yep, yeah, it's failed, that's what I expected. Because sometimes it can fail for completely different reasons. Hurry up and wait. Uh, so I don't know if you've all seen this James Bond film. I can't remember which one was it called. Skyfall, I think it was. So. Um, I can't remember the villain's name, but he had the most ridiculous plan, which seemed to James Bond going and capturing him, bringing him back to London, locking him up, him then escaping, a chase through the underground, then a chat, and then he detonated a bomb at precisely the right time that a train was going past, which then nearly took James Bond out. So that requires an enormous amount of planning and timing. Um, so the hurry up and wait, um, which you can't see again. So. so this is a um, fairly contrived example. So we have a Call it the slow calculator. So it's simulating something that takes a long time or an indeterminate amount of time. Um, so this simply has a total which starts at zero. We've got an add method saying add a delta to it. Sleep for a random time. So it sleeps for somewhere between one millisecond and a second. Uh, and then actually go and update the state. Um, so this is kind of mimicking probably more component level tests, maybe where you're interacting with a database, uh, maybe you're poking something into an endpoint and you're kind of waiting for state to be updated uh, and you don't really have control. It's not like a unit test where you poke something and then immediately it gets done and you know that you can verify the state. Um, so an initial So yeah, I'm probably just going to bin off these slides and I'll just talk through the... Uh... So, <coughs> typical developer's first cut will look like this. So we'll set up the calculator. Um, we will have a test that makes sure that the, the starting con condition is zero. That's fine, we can assert that straight away. It should always be zero as soon as we uh, instantiate it. Uh, and then we have this test where we go, right, okay, well, we'll add five and then we'll just sleep for two seconds because <coughs> we know that 
well, I know in the example that I've just shown you that it should take no longer than a second. So I've kind of arbitrarily capped it at that. So we basically say, well, what's the kind of slowest time we think it'll take? Uh, we'll wait for double that length of time, and then we'll go and check the state. Um, so I see that quite a lot, especially in end-to-end -end tests. So, you know, the problem is that this is really brittle because, okay, so it might take a second on average most times, but what happens if your build box is overloaded? Um, you know, what happens if you're running your build at, you know, so it, it works fine on your machine, you check it in, Jenkins does a checkout, and it fails intermittently because, you know, the build box is running two builds at a time or whatever. Or, you know, it's fine when you checked it in, but then it fails on the overnight. Actually, we're doing lots of stuff. Um, and it kind of defers finding that problem from the actual check-in, so then people don't know why this is failing. And intermittent tests tend to get ignored, and they just go, oh, it's a shit test, so we'll ignore it or whatever. So there's got to be a better strategy than just kind of sleeping for an arbitrary length of time. Um, so the, the next kind of stab at it is we've, we've got our initial starting condition again. Then we can, we can poll. So we can say, okay, well, we'll sleep um, whilst we don't have the expected result. So I expect five, so what I'll do is I'll just keep polling it. So I'll poll it at, at shorter intervals. So here we'll poll for up to 20 times and we'll sleep for 100 milliseconds. So as soon as the expected condition's met, then we bail out and then we do our assertion proper. Um, so that's better because, um, you know, we should... The worst case is the same, so we'll still you know, we'll wait for a maximum of two seconds, um, so it's no worse. Um, but we should kind of come out a lot quicker in a lot of cases. Still doesn't really get around the problem. So because the worst case is the same and we'll bomb out quicker when the conditions met, we could extend the timeout to cover that Jenkins case. So we could say, right, well, we'll set the timeout to... 20 seconds for Jenkins, but we know we'll bomb out after a second on, you know, most test runs. So it is a bit better. But it's more complicated. You know, I had to sit and do mental calculations in my head as to how often to poll and things, and that code's more complicated. You could also skip past, um, it might reach the correct state and then skip on. So if it's doing things like that, you might miss the desired state, so it's still not ideal. So an even better solution is to introduce um, a callback. So we just have a simple interface called a callback, um, which gets invoked when the total gets updated. So our test then becomes a lot simpler. So here we can use, uh, Java's got these things called countdown latches, so you can set them to any arbitrary number. So uh, in this case we set it to one, and then when the callback's invoked we, we count down the latch. So you can wait on the latch. So waiting on the latch means you wait until it hits zero. So what you can do is when we add, It'll do the addition and then it notifies the callback that it's been updated. So what that means is you can then, we get notified immediately. So we can set the, again, we could set the time out a lot, lot higher, but this will lay bomb out a lot quicker and it's also a lot simpler. So the, the logic to wait on the latch is a lot simpler. And this is better not just because um, it's made the test simpler. So it's simpler, it introduces testability into our code. Because we've got that callback, we can now observe when events happen. So it gives us somewhere that we can hook in logging, so we can log when an event's happened. Alerting, so we can alert when something interesting has happened. And monitoring, 
Um, so, you know, we can, we can count the number of invocations or the number of times something's happened. So it's not just a testability thing, it, it also provides places to hook into our system. So it moves from a world where we're checking the state to see if something's happened to a world where we can observe the behavior of the system. So never wait arbitrarily. So when we're doing code reviews, if we th see thread.sleep in any of our tests, we make people refactor them so that they kind of have some uh, callback or some way that they can trip when a, a situation's actually happened. Walling is better than waiting arbitrarily, but it's still not ideal. Better is being able to observe events as they happen. Uh, TikTok. I <laughs> spent ages looking for these uh, things. So, um, so TikTok. Do you remember? Right. So, how do we test something like this? So we have, like, you know, so people log into a website. We want to be able to boot sessions out that haven't been used within an hour or a minute or whatever. Uh, so we might have some code like this. So find sessions not accessed within a value in a time unit. Um, so the, the Java is quite simple. So it says, right, go stream over all the sessions, filter anything that's not been accessed within that value in uh, an unit, and give us back a list that matches that. So that's, and then the and then I hate testing time because it always trips me up. Um, so it's, it's these methods here, or particularly this accessed within method that we're interested in. So we have an attribute called um, get last access time. So working out whether it's accessed within a certain time requires some mental gymnastics, at least on my part. So you add time and then check whether it's equal to now or after now. Um, so the tests are really important because um, it's quite a trick fiddly thing to do. So an initial stab might look like this. So we construct uh, some sessions. Um, the first case is relatively easy. So when we've got a session which has literally just been accessed now, and then we say find sessions not accessed within a minute, then we should get nothing back. So that's nice and easy. Um, and then we want to make sure that only sessions not accessed within a time period are returned. We register a session that's been accessed now, and then we register one that's been accessed two minutes ago. And then we say, right, okay, find the sessions not accessed within a minute. So we're setting a really large boundary there because we're basically saying there's one that definitely should have been um, accessed and there's one that definitely shouldn't have been accessed. But what we really want to know is what happens at the boundary? You know, what happens when it's bang on that minute? Does it get included or does it not? Um, probably don't care, but maybe, well, I don't care as a developer, but maybe the business has a strong opinion that it absolutely has to be, you know, expired on a minute or it's, you know, They've got a minute and it's the minute. So with the current mechanism, we don't really have a good way to test that because I could kind of go, because I have no fine-grained control over time in this test. So how can we make that better? So um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just go straight to the solution. So basically, the solution is to take control of time. So uh, you can do this a number of ways, but because I've used Joda time, which is a library, you can actually cheat. So you can say date time utils there. It says set current fixed, millis fixed. That's basically saying whenever you ask for, the, for now, give them this fixed point in time. So that gives me um, a lot of power because so these, these two tests stay exactly as it is, but I can now write a test um, that's bang on the boundary. Um, so here I can say, because, because I now know that now is fixed, I can say, right, I'll knock it back 61 seconds and see that um, it's included. And then 
if, it's, if I subtract 60 seconds bang on, it's not included. So I can actually write tests that are bang on the boundary and bang on either side and record what happens in those cases. Does that all make sense? I whizzed through that one because I'm... So yeah, so take control of time. So other ways, I think in Java 8, um, you can, they've got a clock interface. So you can obviously, you can pa pass different types of clock. So like a running clock or a fixed clock or an offset clock. So think of time as a service. So something that you can then take control of and own. It allows for precise testing of boundary conditions and the tests are reliable rather than kind of this pot shot in it, you know. <laughs> So the nitpicker, oh. no, exactly. So this is another one. So the nitpicker. Right, what is, can anybody tell me what is wrong with a test like this? So we've got an employee object, they've got a forename and they've got a surname. Um, we build it and then we turn it into XML. So we're trying to check that the right XML is generated. That's so brittle. There you go, that's massively brittle. So um, depending on the platform you're running on, maybe it'll spit out the elements in a different order. Maybe it will add white space. Maybe it'll generate with white space, but it might generate different white space. If I add a new um, attribute, it's fucked. So you just <laughs> you just spend your entire life just going ah, and so you just end up going right. Well, we'll just we'll rerun it through. We'll just capture the XML and we'll just drop it in the test. That's not awesome, really, is it? Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's really brittle and it's really inflexible. So, you know, and it's, it's, it's also testing irrelevant detail. So, okay, so we, we probably care that it's valid XML, um, but just having the stanza and stuff doesn't mean it's valid XML. So one of the things you could do is take the output and see if you can marshal it into an XML DOM, you know, so that test that it is XML and then test the elements separately. Um, so, Round, round tripping is also really good. So turn it into XML and then turn it back into the object and then they're the same. So that's one way of making sure that you know, it survives the whole round trip. But then that round trip test is, is, is reliable and it's not brittle. You know, you add more stuff, it should still pass. Um, and then just care, you know, test for the individual things you care about. So I've got examples. Uh, I was gonna kind of go through these, but we don't have time. So there's the round tripping. So again, I use random test data. So random forename, random surname. Marshal it, and then unmarshal it, and then make sure that they're the same. Um, and then you can test the interesting things. So if I don't set an employee number, but make sure that the um, make sure that you know it doesn't set the element. If I do set the employee number, then just make sure that it's includes that element. There's other things you could do. I mean, you could, you could use something like JSUP or you could marshal it into a DOM and make sure that there's the right number of child elements. But yeah, you know, focus on the things that are important, not just testing a massive hole, because that is just brittle. So I think that's just a repetition. So yeah, break it down. Ignore any irrelevant noise and focus on what is important to test. Is it that if I don't set this attribute, then it's not included? Uh, and then what happens when all these anti-patterns join forces? It just makes projects a fucking nightmare. So, you know, I've been on projects where 
you know, fund well, there's been a, a culture problem and people have focused on end-to-end -end tests. They are, I don't want developers writing unit tests because that's just duplicating what we're doing in the end-to-end -end tests. So let's just write loads and loads of end-to-end -end tests. So we, you know, let's just drive everything through the API because you know, anything you can do through the system, you can do through the API, so let's do it that way. When you compound that with tests that can't control time, you can't observe what's going on in the system, tests that just check, you know, do I get the right XML document out? You know, I've worked on two big projects where we've had three, four hour build times, and it's a bit, you know, evens money that it'll fail in the last 30 minutes for some random intermittent test, but it didn't matter, you had to go back to the start and make sure that you'd seen a build pass before you could merge your code into main, and you'd have like five people sat behind you in the queue. Uh, and it just, you know, saps your will to live when you've kind of got these things. So if you sort of focus in on, you know, small unit tests, make them as reliable as possible, and just have a sort of smattering of these end-to-end -end tests, then it just makes projects go so much smoother. So, yeah, discussion and questions. So I don't know, I was interested to know if people have seen these kind of patterns in the wild, if people, you know, have been bitten by them. Yeah, I got tested, always pass. <laughs> yeah, you always pass, yeah. Yeah, and then when people come to you and you say, you know, this is broken, and you're like, well, it can't be broken because I've tested it. Um, any questions? Stun silence. <laughs> so on the project you were on, what was the solution? Did you just have a sprint of self now with the tests? Uh, people just didn't have the appetite to do it. So they'd just say, you'd, you'd, you'd talk to the lead and they'd go, it's hard, isn't it? And um, so we'd have individuals would take responsibility for sorting stuff out. So you would do simple things like you can still, you know, introduce latches and things like that. And we, because a lot of it used to be they were getting unreliable. So somebody would go, right, well, a timeout of 20 seconds is obviously not long enough. Let's make it 40 seconds. So what used to happen is suddenly build times wouldn't increase slowly. They'd suddenly go from one hour to two hours and then two hours to four hours. So every once in a while, some of us would get pissed off. We'd refactor a load of these tests that had sort of obviously stupid patterns. And we'd get the build time back down to an hour. And you'd kind of have a week of grace. And then people had had slews of other tests. And then suddenly it's like, oh, they're failing. So we'll just bung the time out. And you kind of, it's like a constant battle. Um, yeah, and you know, typically when we're doing things like with selenium and stuff, and you mean, people would just go, right, I'll just wait 30 seconds for the page to load. You can do things like you can do the polling where you can just say, right, I'll, you know, there's one element that's always, when that element appears, I know the page is in a state I can interact with, so I'll just poll for that element. So that, you know, you might have the worst case timeout, but you can maybe bring in the best case and just small improvements like that will shave time off it. You know, and then there's other high-tech solutions like buy more Jenkins boxes and stuff like that. But I mean, well, I mean, never underestimate people's like ability to or desire to want to short circuit doing the hard thing, and they'll just go for easy wins. Ultimately, I think the right thing is to start off properly and maintain the right ratio of quick, reliable tests, and you know, be pretty brutal about the, all those end-to-end -end tests you've got. Is it important that you test every permutation at the front end? I would say not, but you know, people like that confidence. I think there's a couple of the examples are very much anti-patterns that come about from not following the red green refactor of test driven development. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You've not, you've not right, written a failing test, you led to one issue, the, uh, the object mother pattern, um, calls out for refactoring. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, no, you're quite right. I mean, yeah, because I st stick strictly to TDD, that just kind of eliminates one class of problem, like you say. Um, I think the object mother is actually the, one of the most insidious things I've ever seen because actually it seems like a really good idea. And they're the kind of worst kind of, 
worst kind of patterns where somebody sees something and they go, oh, that's really good. And then suddenly it's like all over your code base. And then it's, it's really hard to get out. It's like having a weed grow through everything. And then it makes refactoring so much harder as well. Um, yeah. All right, that's it. Cool. Cheers.